hello students today we'll be studying about the anatomy of the pharynx as well as the esophagus this is dr yusuf signing from aljof university these are the two specific objectives which we'll try to cover describe the specific features like the arterial supply venous drainage lymphatic drainage and nerve supply of pharynx oropharynx as well as the esophagus and localize the constrictions of the esophagus so these are the two specific objectives we'll try to cover in this uh, session so uh, to begin with the pharynx is that part which is behind the oral cavity so this is the pharynx here as well as the nasal uh behind the nose as well as the the larynx so this is the whole thing is the, the pharynx so it is divided divided into three parts which is behind the nose that will be called as nasopharynx which is behind the uh, oral cavity that will be called as oropharynx and which is behind the larynx that will be called as the laryngopharynx so this whole thing is the pharynx so to begin with the pharynx is behind the nasal cavity mouth and the larynx as i said before hence it is divided into three parts nasopharynx oropharynx and the laryngopharynx so this is the nasopharynx oropharynx and the laryngopharynx this is the whole part is the pharynx it is funnel shape with wider upper end lying under the skull so it extends from the skull so it is wider upper end lying just below the the skull here this is the skull here so it is extending from the base of the skull and lower narrow continuously with esophagus at the six cervical vertebra so it continues below as the esophagus below at the six cervical vertebra and it has a musculomembranous wall and it is deficient anteriorly with openings into the nose mouth and inlet of uh, larynx so the wall of the pharynx is made up of um, musculomembranous so it has muscles as well as the membranous but anteriorly it is deficient because of the openings of the oral cavity nasal cavity and the larynx <coughs> the opening of the auditory tube in pharynx connects it with the tympanic cavity so the area here is connected to the pharynx through something called as the auditory tube it is also called as the station tube which is connecting the uh, pharynx with that of the uh, ear here also you can see so this the connection from the ear to the pharynx so here um, this is the oral cavity this is the nasal cavity and behind the nasal cavity this is the nasopharynx which is the behind the oral cavity this is the oropharynx and which is behind the larynx there is the laryngopharynx so below it continues as the esophagus what are the muscles which form the the pharynx so there are two types of muscles circular muscles as well as the longitudinal muscles the circular muscles are three that is the superior constrictor middle constrictor as well as the inferior constrictor the longitudinal muscles are also three these are the salpingopharynx or the salpingopharyngeus muscle the palatopharyngeus muscle as well as the stylopharyngeus muscle so these are the three muscles which are taking origin from different parts and from the part where they take origin Uh, so it includes that name salpingopharynx palatopharynx as well as the stylopharynges so these are three muscles the uh, the uh, circular muscles that is the superior constrictor middle constrictor as well as the inferior constrictor these are three muscles which are circular in nature this is the posterior picture uh, view where we can see the superior constrictor middle constrictor as well as the inferior constrictor they are totally adherent on either side the from either side they are coming to the midline and getting uh, inserted to this line here this is called as the pharyngeal raphe which extend from the the pharyngeal tubercle at the base of the skull and all the way so this is totally covered behind 
to totally closed from behind but anteriorly if you see it is deficient everywhere because of the opening of the oral cavity nasal cavity as well as the larynx itself the the three longitudinal muscles which you can see here will be one is the salpingopharynx so this is the salpingopharyngeus muscle because it is taking origin from the the uh, uh, pharyngeal tympanic tube or the station tube or auditory tube so this is called as the salpingopharyngeus muscle then the muscle which take origin from the palate the soft palate so this is called as the patoglossus muscle then there is a muscle which is taking from the taking origin from the steroid process so this is called as the stylopharyngeus so there are three longitudinal muscles salpingopharyngeus palatopharyngeus as well as the stylopharyngeus these are three longitudinal muscles and the three circular muscles are the superior constrictor middle constrictor as well as the inferior constrictor we will try to study these three muscles again in detail the superior constrictor it is the quadrilateral muscle thin and paler than other constrictors of the pharynx so here also you can see here this is the superior constrictor middle as well as inferior so this is the superior constrictor muscle which is quadrilateral in shape you can see the shape it is almost quadrilateral it is thin paler than other constrictor muscles the origin of this muscle is from uh, different points at the base of the skull we will try to assess this one is the medial pterygoid plate so if you can see here so there is the lateral pterygoid plate and here is the medial pterygoid plate here also on the other side so there is the medial pterygoid plate here on the other side is lateral pterygoid plate so in in the center is the nasal septum these are the concave where the the posterior opening of the nasal cavity is there so this muscle superior constrictor will be taking origin from the mm, the the medial pterygoid plate then we have the pterygoid hamblus so this is a small projection from the medial pterygoid plate this is called as the pterygoid hamblus then the pterygomandibular raphe so there is a small raphe here extending from the uh, the uh, uh, myeloid uh, muscle so this will be called as the pterygomandibular raphe then the posterior end of the myeloid line itself so all this myeloid line will be uh, on the uh, the the uh, in the surface of the mandible where the myeloid muscle is attached of the mandible as well as the side of the tongue so all these are the origin of this muscle the superior constrictor so it will be taking origin from the medial pterygoid plate as well as the pterygoid hamblus then the pterygomandibular raphe which is a raphe which is extending uh, from the pterygoid plate to the mandible then the the posterior end of the myeloid line as well as the mandible uh, the side of the tongue itself so here again you can see here so this is the pharyngeal tubercle and this is the medial plate of the uh, pterygoid yeah. and from there you can see the pterygoid hamblus and in below other two points will be in the mandible the uh, the myeloid line as well as the the side of the tongue everything okay so this is the origin of this muscle the superior constrictor of the uh, pharynx the insertion will be the upper fibers will pass upwards backwards and medially and attached to the pharyngeal tubercle so it will be uh, if you can see here this is the the superior constrictor this is the origin of this muscle and it will be getting insert so this is the origin here from here and it will be going behind and it will be inserted backwards and medially attached to the pterygoid tubercle so here is the pterygoid tubercle or here you can see the uh, the pharyngeal tubercle here so here is also the the pharyngeal tubercle where it is inserted the middle fibers are horizontal and they will be extending along the pharyngeal raphe so the pharyngeal raphe will be extending downwards from the pharyngeal tubercle so this is the raphe here so it will be extending and getting inserted to the pharyngeal raphe the lower fibers run 
uh, obliquely downwards and backwards and medially up to the level of the occal cords and uh, overlapped by the middle constrictor and are attached to the pharyngeal raft itself. So in the lower fibers will be going downwards and get inserted the pharyngeal raphe and they are covered by the middle constrictor of the pharynx. So this is the origin of this muscle as well as the, the insertion. If you can see here, so this is the tergoid hamblus and from here this is the, the uh, raphe which are, this is the pterygomandibular raphe which extend between the, uh, the tergoid hamblus and the, the mandible. So this is the tergoid Terigo mandibular raphe and the myelohyoid line will be from here inside. So it is not seen from this view. From the other side, you can see them. There will be a line called as the myelohyoid line where the myelohyoid muscle is attached. So this muscle will extend all the way from here to here. Medial pterygoid plate, the hamblus, then the terigo mandibular raphe, then the, the posterior end of the myelohyoid line here as well as some part from the tongue also. This is the origin and the insertion will be to the, the pharyngeal tubercle here and then the pharyngeal raphe extending all the way and the, all the fibers will be inserted to this raphe. And the lower part will be covered by the middle constrictor of the pharynx. So again the same has been shown here. So this is the, the medial tergoid plate, this is the tergoid hamblus, this is the tergomandibular raphe and here will be the the malahard line. So these are the origin of the three constrictors, superior, middle as well as the inferior constrictor. So now uh, we'll talk about something called as the sinus of the morgagni. This is a semilunar interval between the upper border and the uh, of the superior constrictor and the base of the skull. So this is the superior constrictor between the upper border of the superior constrictor and the base of the skull there is an opening this is called as the sinus of the morgagni so what's the importance of this morgagni uh, the sinus of morgagni because there will be structures which will be passing through this one is the the auditory tube itself the first one is the auditory tube so this is the cartilage part of the pharyngotympanic tube or the auditory tube which will be passing through this uh, space which is between the upper border of the, uh, the superior constrictor and the base of the skull. The second is the, the levator pal uh, palatine muscle. So here you can see here there is a levator palatine muscle. This is a muscle of the, the palates of palate which will elevate the palate. That's what is called as the levator palatine muscle. So which will be passing through this and getting uh, inserted. The third is the ascending pharyngeal artery which will be passing through this space and the palatine branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery also passes through this space. So there is a small space which is called as the sinus morgagni which is in between the upper border of the, uh, the spear constrictor and the base of the skull. Now coming to the, uh, the uh, middle constrictor. So the middle constrictor muscle, it is a fan shaped muscle. So here you can see this is the middle constrictor of the pharynx, this is the spear constrictor, this is the middle constrictor of pharynx. It forms the part of the floor of the carotid triangle of the neck. It forms a part of the floor of the, if you go deep inside the carotid triangle, which you studied in the triangles of the neck, there, if you go deep inside, then it forms the floor of this triangle. The origin of this muscle is from the lower part of the stylohyoid ligament, as well as the lesser corner and the upper border of the greater corner of the hyoid bone. So if you can see here, so this is the hyoid bone. So it will be taking origin from the from the lesser cornu as well as the upper border of the greater cornea of the hyoid bone. So this is the lesser cornu as well as the upper border of the greater cornu of the hyoid bone. There are two cornus of the hyoid bone. So it takes origin from the lesser cornu as well as the greater cornu of the hyoid bone. Along with that, so here there is something called as the the stylohyoid ligament which is extending from the the styloid process to the hyoid bone so this is the stylohyoid ligament so this muscle also take origin from the stylohyoid ligament as well as the lesser cornu as well as the upper border of the greater cornu of the hyoid bone so this is the origin of this middle constrictor insertion it will be the upper fibers overlap the superior constrictor 
and the lower fibers fibers are overlapped by the inferior constrictor and attached to the pharyngeal raphe all these muscles are attached to the pharyngeal raphe superior constrictor and middle constrictor as well as the inferior constrictor so the upper fibers are covered by the superior constrictor and the lower fibers of this middle constrictor are covered by the uh, inferior constrictor and extend up to the level of the vocal cords it extend all the way up to the vocal cord so this is the middle constrictor of the pharynx so what are the structures passing between the middle and the uh, superior and the middle constrictor so between the superior and middle constrictor as i said it is deficient so there is a big opening here so there are some important structure passing which are those one is the stylopharyngeus muscle and the second is the glossopharyngeal nerve these are the two structures which will be passing through this structures muscles nerves and nerves passing into and out of the oral cavity so one is the stylopharyngeus muscle and the second is the glossopharyngeal two important uh, structures which will be passing through this big opening between the superior and the middle constrictor pharynx then the third is the inferior constrictor of the pharynx this is the inferior constrictor of the pharynx it is the thickest of all the three constrictor of the pharynx it forms the floor of the carotid triangle of the neck and it is related to the medial surface of the lobe of the thyroid gland so inferior constrictor of the pharynx can be seen here also so it is the thickest of all the three constrictor of the pharynx as well as the biggest also and it forms the floor of the carotid triangle if you pierce from the uh, the triangles of the neck the carotid triangle deep inside is the inferior constrictor of pharynx and it is related to the medial surface of the lobe of the thyroid gland there will be thyroid gland here just below the thyroid cartilage and it will be uh, related to medial surface of the lobe of the thyroid gland the origin of this muscle is from two parts one is the called as the thyropharyngeal part and the second is the cricopharyngeal part the thyropharyngeal part will be taking origin from the oblique line and the inferior horn of the thyroid cartilage if you can see here so this is the thyroid cartilage this will be taking origin from the oblique line here as well as the inferior horn of the thyroid cartilage the thyroid cartilage also has a superior horn as well as the inferior horn so it will be taking origin from the the oblique line as well as the the inferior horn of the thyroid cartilage there is the second part which is called as the cricopharyngeus again this is called a thyropharyngeus because it is taking origin from the thyroid thyroid cartilage and this is called a cricopharynx pharyngeus because it is taking origin from the cricoid cartilage so this part will be taking origin from the side of the arch of the cricoid cartilage where is the cricoid cartilage here is the cricoid cartilage so this will be taking origin from the uh, side of the uh, arch of the cricoid cartilage so this muscle depending on the origin has two parts uh, thyroid thyroid part uh, which is called as the thyropharyngeal part then the cricoid part which is called as the cricopharyngeal part so these are two parts of the the same uh, inferior constrictor of the pharynx here also you can see the same muscle so the thyroid cartilage and from the cricoid cartilage here also you can see the so the insertion of this uh, again this muscle the fibers of the thyropharyngeal part will pass upward backward and attach to the fibrous raphe the fibers of the cricopharyngeal part are horizontal and surround the upper end of the esophagus and become continuous with the muscles of the opposite side so all this will be getting inserted to the the fibrous raphe behind and the lower part will continue and it totally covers uh, joins with the opposite side and it will cover the posteriorly uh, the small part of the esophagus also structures passing between the middle and inferior constrictors there are some structures which will be passing between the middle and inferior constrictor also so one is the internal laryngeal nerve and the superior laryngeal vessels these are the structures which will be passing between the uh, the middle and the inferior constrictor of pharynx so there are structures which are passing above the uh, the superior constrictor and the base of the skull there are structures passing between the superior and middle and the structure passing between the middle and the inferior constrictor of the pharynx there are also some structures which are passing below the inferior constrictor of the pharynx so these are the recurrent laryngeal nerve as well as the inferior laryngeal vessel so these are the some of the structures which will be passing uh, below this inferior constrictor of the pharynx 
Now coming to the actions of these constrictors, the constrictor of the pharynx contracts reflexly during deglutition and thereby uh, pushing bolus of the foot into the lower part. So it helps in the propulsion of the, the bolus of the foot. So it will push downwards if you can see here. So here is the foot bolus and it will be pushed downwards with the constrictors of the pharynx. They help in the pushing of the bolus downwards. Thyropharyngeal part is propulsive in action while the cricopharyngeal part has a spintric action. So the inferior constrictor which has the two parts, the thyropharyngeus will be propulsive, it will be pushing the forward downwards and the cricopharyngeal because it is continuous with the opposite side on the posterior side. So it acts as a spintric action. It has spindle like action it can close the esophagus the upper part of esophagus when thyropharyngeal part contracts cricopharyngeal part relaxes to allow the bolus of the foot into esophagus even though the thyropharyngeal and the cricopharyngeal are the same part of the inferior constrictor of pharynx but they uh, have opposite action and they are uh, actually helping each other so whenever the cricopharyngeal part will push the ball downwards, this uh, cricopharyngeal part will relax. When the thyropharyngeal part uh, pushes the foot downwards, then the cricopharyngeal part will relax and it allows the bolus to uh, move downwards. Now coming to the blood supply, it is mainly by the as ascending pharyngeal artery here, you can see here this the ascending pharyngeal artery, then the tonsillar branch of the facial artery facial artery has not been here it is a short artery it has not been shown complete uh, here so this is the facial artery here which has been shown here so it will be giving some branches called, which are to the tonsil from there it will be uh, supplying uh, the the uh, uh, pharynx the tonsillar branches of the facial artery as well as the branches of the maxillary artery maxillary artery again has not been shown here so this is the external carotid artery divides into maxillary artery and then the uh, here it has been shown okay so this is the maxillary artery uh, with the other branch of the external carotid will be the uh, ascending uh, the superficial temporal artery so this is the superficial temporal artery and the maxillary artery branches of the external carotid artery so the maxillary artery will be giving branches as well as the lingual artery also gives some branches so lingual artery and the maxillary artery give some branches but the main artery will be the ascending pharyngeal artery and the tonsillar branch of the facial artery. So these are some of the arteries which will be supplying the, the pharynx. The venous drainage is by formation of a plexus which joins with the pterygoid venous plexus and drains into the internal jugular vein. There will be a vein here, prominent vein called an internal jugular vein where the plexus of vein around the pharynx will drain into this uh, 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 this vein from the pterygoid venous plexus which will be draining into the internal jugular vein which has not been shown here it will be present here somewhere coming to the nerve supply the motor supply of all these muscles of the pharynx is by the pharyngeal plexus pharyngeal plexus is the plexus of nerves which will be supplying all the muscles of the pharynx except except the stylopharyngeus which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve except the stylopharyngeus out of the six muscles three circular and three longitudinal all six or five are supplied by the the pharyngeal plexus except the stylopharyngeus which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve now we will try to understand uh, the sensory nerve supply so this was about the motor supply the sensory nerve supply so in the nasopharynx it will be by the maxillary nerve to the oropharynx will be the grossopharyngeal nerve and the laryngopharyngeus will be the internal laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve so this is the nasopharynx which will be supplied by the maxillary nerve then the oropharynx which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve and the laryngopharynx which will be supplied by the inferior the internal laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve coming to uh, understand what exactly is the pharyngeal plexus we said all muscles of the uh, pharynx are supplied by the pharyngeal plexus except the style of pharyngeus which is supplied with loss of pharyngeal nerve so we should know what is the pharyngeal plexus so this is the plexus of nerves formed by the cranial part of the accessory through the pharyngeal branch of the vagus 
the pharyngeal branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve as well as the pharyngeal branch of the superior cervical ganglion of the sympathetic all these will be uh, for forming the pharyngeal plexus so the pharyngeal plexus is formed by the pharyngeal branch of the the cranial of the of the glossopharyngeal nerve the cranial part of the accessory to the pharyngeal branch of the vagus and the pharyngeal branch of the superior cervical ganglion the sympathetic all this will form the pharyngeal plexus coming to the lymphatic drainage of the pharynx so the pharynx is directly draining into the deep cervical group of lymph nodes there are deep cervical group of lymph nodes where it will be draining directly indirectly into the retropharyngeal or paratracheal group of lymph nodes into deep cervical uh, nodes so it will be draining into the mainly into the deep cervical group of lymph nodes uh, or sometimes indirectly through the retropharyngeal nodes as well as paratracheal nodes again back into the deep cervical group of lymph nodes this is the lymphatic drainage of the pharynx now we should know what is the interior of the pharynx interior of pharynx is divided into three parts then as you have already seen the nasopharynx oropharynx as well as the laryngopharynx so we'll try to study the interior features of the each part the first is the nasopharynx so this nasopharynx is the uppermost part of the pharynx it lies above the soft palate and behind the nasal cavity that's what is called as the nasopharynx because it is behind the nasal cavities roof is submucosal layer contains collection of the lymphoid tissue called as the pharyngeal tonsil you can see here so this is the nasopharynx so the roof has collection of lymphoid group of lymph nodes these are called as the pharyngeal tonsil at the base of the, the skull so roof is uh, covered by submucosal layer and it contains lymphoid tissue called as the pharyngeal tonsil later uh, if it is enlarged especially in case of children it get infected and enlarged then it is called as adenoids where the child will have difficulty in breathing and the small children will stop feeding because they cannot breathe during uh, 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 during the suckling of the milk so that is the pharyngeal tonsil so here this is the pharyngeal tonsil which leads to adenoids then there is something called as the pharyngeal isthmus is the opening in the floor between the soft palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall so there is a small opening that is called as the pharyngeal opening uh, isthmus the opening in the floor between the soft palate and the posterior pharyngeal wall then we have the pharyngeal isthmus the lateral wall has opening for the auditory tube apart from the pharyngeal isthmus the lateral wall has the opening for the auditory tube so you can see here so this is for the opening of the auditory tube and there is elevated ridge on which it is called as the tubal elevation around this auditory opening there is an elevation this is called as the the tubal elevation and there are small group of lymph nodes there also these are called as the tubal tonsils then there is something called as the pharyngeal recess is a depression in the pharyngeal wall behind the tubal elevation just behind the tubal elevation there are small recess or depression these are called as the pharyngeal recess okay small this is the depression which is called as the pharyngeal recess then there is an elevated fold this called as the salpingopharyngeal fold which is nothing but the mucosal fold covering the salpingopharyngeal muscle so there will be salpingopharyngeal muscle which will extend downwards so you can see here so this is the salpingopharyngeal fold which is covering the salpingopharyngeal muscle so these are some of the features which you can see within in the nasopharynx one is the the auditory tube opening then there is elevation then we have the pharyngeal recess as well as the salpingopharyngeal fold coming to the oral oropharynx 
it leave behind lies because it is uh, behind the oral cavity that's why it is called as the oropharynx it lies behind the oral cavity and the floor is formed by the posterior one third of the tongue the posterior one third of the tongue will be forming the floor of this oropharynx and the interval between the tongue and the epiglottis so if you can see here from behind so this is the nasopharynx and here is the oropharynx so here you can see uh, uh, the posterior one third of the tongue will be forming the floor of this uh, oropharynx and the interval between the tongue and the epiglottis. This is the epiglottis here and the tongue, there is an interval between them. So the midline shows the median glossopiglottic fold. In the center, there is something called as fold extending from the, the uh, posterior one third of the tongue to the epiglottis, there is called as the median glossopiglottic fold, and on the lateral side also there is mucosal fold, this is called as the lateral glossoepiglottic fold. So there is the lateral glossopiglottic fold on either side, which is also called as here as the palatopharyngeal arch. So this is nothing but the lateral glo lateral glossopiglottic fold and in the center which is connecting between the tongue and the epiglottis that is called as the median glossopiglottic fold so there is a depression between the median glossopiglottic fold and the lateral glossopiglottic fold on either side so there is a depression here space so this is called as the vallecula so there is the vallecula here so there is a small depression between the median and lateral glossopiglottic fold so this is called as the Valacula. So here you can see. So between the tongue and this is the the epiglo the um, the epiglottis. So between the epiglottis and the tongue, the depression is called the valacula on either side. The lateral wall shows palatoglossal as well as the palatopharyngeal arch. We have seen the palatopharyngeal arch as well as the palatoglossal fold mucous membrane covering the respective muscles and that leads to palatoglossal and the palatopharyngeal arches or folds and you can also see the palatine tonsil so so here you can see on either side even from the front you can see this is the palatine tonsil so here you can see these are two folds which you are discussing palatoglossal as well as the palatopharyngeal fold there are two folds here mucosal fold this is the palatoglossal arch or fold then the palatopharyngeal arch and in between we can see the palatine tonsil so if you want to trace the tonsil first trace these two arches palatoglossal arch and the palatopharyngeal arch and in between you can see the tonsil this is the palatine tonsil the interval between the palatoglossal arch is oropharyngeal isthmus and marks the boundary between the mouth and the pharynx so between the two palatoglossal arches so the, the palatoglossal arch on one side the other side is in this one and in between you can see the ula and this is called as the oropharyngeal stomach this opening between the two arches the two palatoglossal arches is the uh, opening this is called as the oropharyngeal stomach uh, because it connects the oro, uh, oral cavity with that of the oropharynx so that's what is called as the oropharyngeal isthmus and this marks the boundary between the mouth and the pharynx now coming to the laryngopharynx which is the space behind the larynx so this lies behind the opening of the larynx so this is the opening of the larynx from the epiglottis to the eriepiglottic fold on either side so these are the eriepiglottic folds and the epiglottis so this is the opening of the larynx and just behind that whatever space you are seeing here this is the laryngopharynx the lateral wall is formed by the the thyroid cartilage if you can see here on either side there will be thyroid cartilage it has not been shown here but usually there will be thyroid cartilage and the thyroid membrane will be present here there is a small uh, uh, fossa or recess on either side. This is called as the piriform recess or fossa. It's a depression in the mucous membrane on each side of the laryngeal inlet. This is the laryngeal inlet and just beside that there is a small fossa. This is called as the piriform fossa or recess. This is important space where usually the foreign bodies can be held. 
So the piriform fossa, it is a small pouch or recess of the mucous membrane situated in the lateral wall of the laryngopharynx on either side of the laryngeal inlet. So this is the piriform fossa or the recess. It is narrow below and broad above. It extends obliquely downwards backwards from the back of the tongue to the esophagus. The boundaries are on either side. Medially we have the area epiglottic fold. So medially we have the area epiglottic fold on either side of the recess. Then we are laterally we have the thyroid cartilage here will be the thyroid cartilage and inner surface of the thyroid membrane so there will be also the thyroid membrane which will be between the thyroid as well as the hyoid bone cartilage thyroid cartilage and the hyoid bone there will be small membrane that is called a thyroid membrane so that will be also laterally placed on the periform fossa Deep to piriform fossa are the internal laryngeal nerve and the superior laryngeal vessel. This is the important space where you can trace the internal laryngeal nerve as well as the superior laryngeal vessel if you are doing some surgeries on them. So the importance of this piriform fossa, it is the site of silent carcinoma. Usually there might be development of the carcinoma because of the regular friction because the food particles will be passing through this space. So there will be friction which leads to silent carcinoma. It is also the common site for the ingested foreign particles of the fish bones, which as I said before. So this is also the site for the foreign particles of the fish bones. So if there are any uh, foreign particles of the fish bones are uh, ingested then you should trace this in this piriform fossa. Now let's discuss about the pharyngeal pouch. It is also called as Killian's dehiscence. So what is this pharyngeal pouch? It's a potential gap between the upper oblique as well as lower horizontal fibers. That is we have studied already the, uh, uh, the inferior constrictor of pharynx has uh, two types of uh, fibers one taking origin from the the uh, thyroid cartilage and the second one from the cricoid cartilage so it has two parts thyropharyngeus as well as cricopharyngeus so this is the potential gap between these two types of fibers so it is a potential gap between upper oblique that is the uh, the thyropharyngeus and the lower horizontal fiber that is the cricopharyngeus of the inferior constrictor of the pharynx so it's a small uh, potential space between the upper fibers and lower fibers of the inferior constrictor of the pharynx somewhere here so marked by a sim uh, dimple in lining mucous membrane so um, when you see from inside inside the cavity so there there will be a just a small because it is a potential shape so uh, it is a potential gap so it is a very small dimple can be seen in the lining mucous, uh, mucous membrane from inside. So what is the function of this pharyngeal pouch? The function of the uh, uh, pharyngeus, the importance of this pharyngeal pouch, we'll study this. The function of the pharyngeus is to prevent air into esophagus. So as we studied before, the pharyngeus will be uh, actually totally surrounding the esophagus, the opening of the esophagus and usually uh, it uh, they say that it is uh, it prevents air from entering the esophagus when you swallow uh, uh, some food material or some water or some juice or something like that but it is not sure so incomplete relaxation of this cricopharyngeus during swallowing leads to increased pressure and diverticulum so whenever the cricopharyngeus uh, relaxes incompletely, uh, incompletely, then at that time it leads to uh, increased pressure and diverticular, especially during swallowing. This diverticulum filled with food leads to dysphagia. So, in this pharyngeal pouch, which is the pouch between the two uh, types of fibers of the uh, inferior constrictor of ph pharynx, uh, so at that time, whenever uh, there is incomplete relaxation and when the person tries to swallow at that time this diverticulum will be filled with food material and this uh, this leads to difficulty in swallowing that is called as dysphagia so this was about the the pharyngeal pouch so it's a potential space which uh, collects some food material when there will be incomplete relaxation of the cricopharyngeus 
which leads to uh, some pain difficulty in swallowing that is the dysphagia now let's discuss about the uh, the other contents in the uh, pharynx that is the palate and tonsil we have already seen the palate and tonsil so this is the palate and tonsil uh, it's a pair of masses of lymphoid tissue collection of the lymphoid tissue located on the lateral wall of the oropharynx so this is the oropharynx which you can free see from the uh, front view when the person is asked to open the mouth and between the the two arches here one is called as the palatoglossal arch and behind we have the palatopharyngeal arch between these two arches you can see the the palate and tonsil it is nothing but the collection of lymphoid tissue it is covered by mucous membrane but uh, it is not uh, smooth as it is in other parts of the uh, oral cavity and it will show many uh, uh, pitted uh, appearance pitted by numerous small openings that leads into the tonsillar crypt so when you study the histology at that time you can see there is tonsillar crypt and these small openings will uh, actually allow the food particles to enter and uh, they will reach the tonsillar crypt lateral surface is covered by fibrous capsule so th this is the what you are seeing is the medial surface it is just covered by mucous membrane but the lateral surface is covered by thick capsule is there fibrous capsule will be on the lateral surface there is no capsule on the medial surface and this palate and tonsil is especially it reaches the maximum size during the early childhood later it start regressing so whenever there is a uh, any problem with this uh, tonsil it is usually in the teenage group when there might be in the children or in case of the teenage group after that it start regressing so uh, sometimes whenever there is infection these uh, tonsils be, might become uh, uh, big swollen as well as uh, reddish in appearance and sometimes uh, if they become very big then it will be very difficult for the uh, the, uh, the child to swallow and it will be very painful swallowing Coming to the blood supply of this palate and tonsil, it is supplied by the tonsillar artery, a branch of the facial artery. So tonsillar artery is a branch of the facial artery which will be supplying the, the tonsil. And the venous drainage is by the external palatine vein which will be draining into the finally into the pharyngeal venous plexus. Lymphatic drainage is into the upper deep cervical group of lymph nodes just behind the angle of the mandible. So, the lymphatic drainage it will be to the deep cervical upper deep cervical limb nodes and just behind the the mandible apart from the palate and tonsil there are other types of tonsils which are covering the the elementary tract uh, at the beginning of the elementary tract so this is called as the waldas ring so what is this waldas ring it is a ring formed by groups of lymphoid tissue that surround the opening of the respiratory as well as the digestive system so if you see here at this juncture there are a lot of collection of lymphoid tissues or the uh, uh, lymphoid organs which will be surrounding at this point and they uh, actually they filter the air which we respire or uh, we inspire as well as the food particles which we ingest so all these are filtered here by the presence of this uh, this line acts as the first line of defense uh, so this is the collection of lymphoid tissue which will be present here so this collection of lymphoid tissue present here uh, in the form of a ring will be called as the waldas ring so what does this waldas ring contain so in the lateral part it is formed by the palate and tonsil we have seen already the palate and tonsil in the oropharynx so this will be the palate and tonsil which is one of the component of the waldas ring and the tubal tonsil if you see here this is the auditory tube or the station tube around this also there will be a small collection of the new for tissue so that is called a tubal tonsil and in case of the oropharynx there will be the palate and tonsil and in case of the roof there will be also collection of lymphoid tissue this is called as the pharyngeal tonsil which i told when sometimes in case of children they enlarge if they are infected then they get enlarged and that leads to something called as adenoids and in the lower part the we have seen that the lower most lower uh, uh, the the posterior most part of the tongue that is the posterior one third of the tongue is also having collection of lot of uh, lymphoid tissue so this is called as 
this is called as the lingual tonsil so here we have the lingual tonsil and on the sides on either side we have the palatine tonsil and above in the uh, 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 the posterior part of the uh, nasal cavity that is in the uh, nasopharynx you can see collection of the uh, the tubal tonsil and at the roof of the nasal cavity you can see the pharyngeal tonsil so all these together they form a ring around the nasal as well as the oral cavity which will be acting as the first line of defense and this together this is called as the Waldeus ring. The applied aspect related to this Waldeus ring is penetrant uh, tonsillar abscess that is called as quincy. Sometimes this palatine tonsil get infected and there might be collection of lot of flu pus. So this condition is called as quincy. And as I said, in case of the pharyngeal tonsil, they can also get infected and large and there might be difficulty in swallowing for the child because the child cannot suckle the milk because the nasal cavity is closed. When, whenever the baby tries to suckle milk from uh, the mouth, it has to respire from the nose. At that time, it cannot because the, this adenoids has enlarged to a very large extent and that's why the baby starts uh, stops feeding so this condition is, is called as the adenoids so this happens when there is infection of the uh, pharyngeal tonsil so quincy is the condition where there will be collection of pus in case of the palatine tonsil because of infection and if there is any infection in the pharyngeal tonsil and the enlargement of this pharyngeal tonsil lead to a condition called as adenoids